Hello, can you hear me? Yeah? Yeah, okay. Uh, values. Well, it's the easiest thing to talk about your values because you've all got them. Every one of you has already got some. Uh, and what is a value? It's a, one of those things that among all the beliefs you have, and you have many, many, many beliefs, some of them are more valuable to you. They are the most valuable parts of your beliefs, and so we call them values. So you may believe in all kinds of strange things, and a few of them will become values. Among your values, some of them will become so important that they actually affect your behavior. Now, one of the things that we need to think about is, what is the difference between what we say our values are and what our behavior actually is? Now, one of my uh, early influences in thinking about this was a, a woman called Marion Milner. She was a psychoanalyst in the United Kingdom. And Marion Milner, in one of her books, said, the problem is that all of us measure ourselves by our intentions. But other people measure us by our actions. So we go around in our head, we are Santa Claus, we are holy, we are good people, we are all of these wonderful things. But people experience how we behave. And this is the challenge. How do we close the gap and become more authentic? Now this is an extremely complicated thing to do. Very few people actually achieve this. Uh, and so what I want to do is take you through some of the difficulties, uh, because one of my joys in life is explaining to people that life is not easy, okay? Uh, and it's easy to say there are two verses in the Bible of the something that you follow, or just follow Jesus and you'll be fine. Actually, it's tough to do that. It's really tough. And I know that when, when I believe somebody is authentic and following good values, and I've not met many people who can do this, they exhibit what in the Bible we call the fruits of the Spirit. And we know what these are, or many of us will know what they are. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I don't know how many people you know who do all this every day. Every time you meet them, say, ah, here's somebody who's doing all of these things. I find it unusual. You know, I don't know many of these people. So let's look at some of the challenges that actually we, we face in these things. So one of the things that's a spiritual concept uh, is the notion of discernment. Are you, are you interested in the concept of discernment? It's that thing where your inner voice, your inner voice starts to give you little messages that things may not be okay, or maybe you should change your attitude about something. And I, years ago, I put together a thing for, uh, for a training program looking at where do the other voices come from. So we have the voices of our organization, yeah, they may be a corporate center, maybe your mentor in the organization, maybe the local people who work with you, your peer group. Then you've got your own job and the individual duties that you choose. Uh, then you have the environment, all the things round about you, putting pressures on you. And you have to make all this work. And we're going to talk about this in a bit more depth. But the key thing is, in your head there's a voice. And the voice is either saying, this is okay, or it's saying, no, not, not so sure, not quite confident that we've got this right. And so it's partly that journey that I want to talk about, how we actually have for this. So here's a couple, here are some questions about leadership. If I am your leader, where do I get the moral authority for my decisions? I may have the authority because I'm the boss. But where do I get the moral authority? And if I'm, oh, by the way, you can feel free to take photographs of these, but as far as I'm concerned, you can all have copies of all of this. Just uh, somebody, somebody here who will be helpful will can give you a copy of it all. I don't know who the helpful person is, but they will be exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit when they send you this. 
So, where will I find the moral authority? Where do I actually get these key values that I need? Next thing is, do I only want to discover these when the decision has to be made? Or should I be thinking about them before the time comes, with my elders, with my mentors, with the people who are going to guide me? And of course, that's what these programs are partly about, getting people ready before the problem to think about it before they have to make the decision. Because usually, when you're in the middle of a big decision, it's too late to do your thinking. Okay? In one of your local newspapers here, Isabel, my wife's Isabel, she's the beautiful blonde lady there with the blue dress. Uh, <laughs> uh, and we were reading that paradise without a plan doesn't work. Okay? So, you're going to have to do that. Another question, what are the uncomfortable influences on your decision making? Where does the pressure come from that actually forces you into decisions? Now, of course, we've just heard from the, uh, the Funda Vida about people who are the children of sex workers. You can see where the pressure comes from in their life. You, know? you can see in many cases where the pressures actually come from, where the influences are. So these are some of the questions. Uh, this is just another way of saying what I said earlier. There are several streams of values which will be working on you and possibly confusing you or making it more difficult for you to find an, a pathway that's easy. Here's the biggest question of all. Are you decision taking or decision making? Sounds like an easy question. Okay? What do I mean by this? Well, there is a, there's a lot of our life is done by decision taking. And that's where the environment tells you the answer before you even have the question. So I am going to buy 12 bottles of mineral water. And my boss says, go and buy the cheapest ones you can find in the supermarket. And one set of bottles cost 500 colones and the next one costs 200 colones. Do I have to make a decision? No. You take the decision. It's just there. The environment has provided it. If you're an accountant or if you're in procurement or if you're in human resources or in many of these things, you will just be making, sorry, taking decisions. We need somebody who has a doctorate. Justin is the only person who applies for the job who has a doctorate. Okay, we take the decision. That's okay. Problem is, most of our life, the difficult things come when we have to make a decision. But it is not obvious what the correct decision is. When, okay, this may be the best mineral water, or the cheapest mineral water, but actually the better one has a little bit of vitamin A in it and it costs an extra hundred colones, is it worth the extra money? How will we know? How disadvantaged are we? Have we got the money? What are our reserves? And there are many, many places in our life where we have to make decisions. And I'm gonna talk a bit about some of the difficulties of making decisions. And the reason it's important is because your values become strategically important when you're making decisions. Not, they're less important when you're taking decisions. And the reason that that's important is because when you make decisions, you are actually driving the actions that follow. So your values are part of how you make the decision. That flows into action, and you don't care about my values. I promise you, even if you love me, you know, and you think I'm a nice guy and it's wonderful for me to be here in Costa Rica on my first visit. You don't care about my, my values, but you do care about my decisions if they affect you. So we've got to work on these things, get ready for those. And of course when we make decisions we have to exercise our judgment. And here's the difficulty. For most things, where we have to require our judgment, that is when you do not know and you cannot know what to do. 
Because if you didn't know, and it was obvious what you were going to do, you would just take the decision. It's obvious, you know. You, know, you can tell I'm a fat man, right? So when I go into shop, I can look, and here are all the suits for the slim people, and here are the ones for the fat people, okay? I can take a decision very quickly. I don't need to make a decision about that, okay? So it's available, what you're actually going to do. But when you don't know what to do, and you cannot know what to do, your values actually become significant. Because they then say, ah, should I have a fat jacket which looks longer, so maybe makes me look slightly taller? Or should I have something that is double-breasted, folds over? I can pretend I'm slimmer. Of course, none of you have this problem. You know? I'm the only person in the room with this problem. But it's one of these things where making decisions, even in simple things, can actually be quite challenging. So, let's look at judgment making in hard cases, when it's not you know, something like getting a new jacket. When you have to make important decisions on the basis of insufficient data, Often the case, we're going to go into a poor neighborhood in San Jose and we're going to work with disadvantaged kids. We've decided which neighborhood, which disadvantaged kids. How will we know which has got the best cultural support locally, which has the best school system to back up what we do, where will there be local churches that can be added on? There are many questions that come from these things where you will not know and you cannot get the data. You often will not know what's relevant or what's irrelevant to your decision. Things that look important to you, five years later you look back and say, I don't even know why I worried about that. It was irrelevant. But in my head it was a big problem and so I uh, had worries about it. So that's very difficult to decide where you do not know how your actions will be interpreted. Now, can you imagine, let's say we all decide in this room that we want to change society in Costa Rica and we're all going to become politicians. What have we immediately become? We've immediately become people who are hated by the citizens. Are you different today? than you were yesterday, now that you've decided to become a politician. Actually, you're the same guy, you're the same woman, but you've decided to make a difference. But what does society think about politicians? No, oh, a bit dodgy, you know, usually not quite straight, funny values. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on these. Uh, but this is one of the ones that's really difficult. Where the costs and the benefits of something and the long-term consequences may be difficult to discern when you can't actually work out among a variety of things that you might choose to do, which ones are the best. And of course the difficulty here is that every decision you make has unintended consequences. You know, we make a decision thinking it will have consequences that we intend, but it also has unintended consequences. Now, I thought you'd all nod your head when I was saying that, uh, but uh, it's one of the curious things. So here we go talking about the ways that we can communicate our values. Uh, and as I said earlier, there's a, a key difference between uh, the way that we react. We can communicate out of our beliefs. And we've all got lots of beliefs. And uh, quite often people uh, will speak very sincerely about the beliefs. Some of those beliefs are really important and then we'll focus on them and they will be our values. And so we put lots of energy into that. Or people just react to our behavior. The problem is, well it's not the problem, just the fact is, that people react differently to each of these three stimuli. If you talk out of your beliefs, whether this is in politics, or in the pulpit, or in a company, 
or anywhere else, if you just talk from your beliefs, then what people experience is what in the advertising industry and in politics we call hype. It's just propaganda. It's just propaganda. And so we're all capable of doing this and often we will do it. Uh, when you communicate out of your values, people who are hoping to follow you start to experience hope because they can see that these things are actually important for you. They, they're really significant, they're important for you. We know this is the case. Uh, many of us who've worked in large organizations or even small organizations, we have a thing on the wall that says, here are the company values. And if you're just joining the company and it's the first day and you look at the values and you like the values and you think, oh wow, I'm going to be working in a place where this is, this is really good, you know? They're kind to puppy dogs. That's important, right? Uh, they make statements which are hopefully intended to make you believe and behave the same way. But the problem is, if they don't deliver on that, you get a negative effect. So when you actually communicate out of your behavior and people see what you actually do, then you will build hope, uh, sorry, help. So you move from help to hope. Now here is the difficulty for all of you who are involved in leadership. Now this is true of leaders, whether it's tiny little children or whether they're the vice presidents of your global company. If you build hope, and you work at building hope, and then you do not deliver on help, you actually rob people, you steal from them something that they did not have until you gave them it. They did not have the hope. You gave them the hope. And then you failed to, to keep your promise because the value statement was actually not true. It didn't come into the reality of your behavior. So there are big challenges here. And uh, I've been professor in the business school and I've spoken in many, many business schools. Uh, and everywhere I go, there is a standard statement. You have to, you have to, bosses have to walk around and talk to everybody. You know, every boss should be walking and talking. I always tell people, be careful what you say. Be ex if you're the boss and you go around and you talk too much, people hear what you say as a promise. And if you cannot deliver on the promise, then you rob them of something they didn't have. And if you didn't come and you didn't talk to them, they would not have that hope. So it's a curious thing because I'm saying the opposite to what other people typically teach. Now, I, I think you probably can't read this, but do you all know this diagram? Uh, there are va varieties of it. There's an Ikigai one from uh, Japan. There's, this one, I think, is an Ashanti one. Uh, comes from, uh, uh, from Kenya. And uh, basically what it says is that in an ideal situation, if, if your life, working life works out really well, you will find your purpose. And your purpose will be a mixture of you're great, you're great at these things, you're really good at them, you actually get paid for it, the world really needs it, you know, you're not just doing it because it's good fun, the world needs it, and you love doing it. And these things, if they, you know, if we draw the Venn diagrams, uh, if you're great at it and you love it, it becomes a passion. Okay? And we're using passion here in the modern American sense of the word, where passion means enthusiasm. Those of you who, who have uh, some familiarity with the Bible will know that the passion of Christ, well, it was in Theos, it was in the spirit, but actually passion is about suffering. If you're passionate about something, you will suffer for it. So if you're passionate about marathon running, you train to become a marathon runner. If you're passionate about cycling, you build up your muscles. If you're passionate about playing chess, you have to learn all the moves, all the openings, all the closings. 
So let's not just have passion as enthusiasm, because we're shortchanging. So anyway, if, if you get these things together, this is great. You have a fantastic purpose and everything works. The problem is that most of us end up somewhere. And the challenge is, do your values from this part dominate your values for this part? So you're paid for it. The world needs it. Justin's a really good example here. He decided early on that the world needed something to do with poverty. Ten years old, right? He manages now to get paid for it because he was passionate enough to fail his exams but work hard to pass his exams and grind through the thing and as a consequence he has an internal authority and authenticity which is based on the fact that he's trying to make this whole thing work. But I bet you, and I have not asked him this question, at various times the competition between these values inside his head would have been significant and they would have been significant for Ivona as well. Uh, that, that, that whole internal dialogue. So the idea of values as being something that's you know, nice and simple and clear is a, a difficult thing. Now, I, I wonder how many of you have ever seen this. This is a piece of candy from, uh, from the United Kingdom. Any of you ever seen this stuff before? Just sugar. Okay, it's just sugar. And it comes from a city with a beach called Weymouth. And we were there with some friends uh, just a few weeks ago. And uh, Isabel and I were walking along and we saw this and I knew I was going to be talking about values and how deep do the values go. And so I bought a piece of candy. Now why did I buy this piece of candy? Because if you look here, it says Weymouth, okay? And if you look at the other end, it says Weymouth as well. It goes all the way through it. So, I, we can sweep that up later. All the way through is Weymouth. By the way, it's highly edible, you might really enjoy it but beware of your teeth as a consequence. Uh, and that certainty that something goes all the way through is the desirable position for all this. But of course it's really difficult to get right. Uh, so we call this rock, R-O-C-K. Just like a rock that you get outside, because actually if you try and crunch it with your teeth, you'll discover it's just like the stuff outside. Uh, that's the same kind of thing. Uh, some of you heard me speak earlier this week and I was speaking about the difference uh, that we face between the challenges of the work that we do and the capability that we have. Our ability at, at, at the level of maturity that we have in our life to handle decision making and to manage complexity. And can you read this at the back? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so basically what it says, and this is the uh, original idea comes from a, uh, a, a Czech uh, psychologist called Csikszentmihalyi. The idea is that in this space here, where your capability and the challenge you face are, are roughly equal, uh, then you end up in a situation where your life just flows. You have energy to do things, your, your brain works well, uh, life is great, and uh, quite often uh, that's the state that we're trying to get people to move into when we're thinking about motivation. But the difficulty becomes that if the challenge is greater than our capability, this is capability, here is the challenge. If the challenge becomes greater, you become perplexed, that means not quite able to work things out. Or you become worried. Or if it's really strong, you will become anxious. Now what happens to your values when you're anxious? You know what happens to your values when you're anxious. You lose everything except survival. You focus on that narrow slice of things which allow you to survive. Similarly down here, if you become 
underachieving, you have not given the challenge of the job, then you'll become frustrated at first. What happens to your values when you become frustrated? You know, when you can't be bothered any, you're just, it's boring as well, even if you get more bored. How much attention do you, do you give to a problem when you're bored? Do you give it your whole personality? You don't. So there are these things which come at us, which get in the way of us using all of our capability and all of our values, even if in the middle we have a stick of rock. Now the hope is that if you do have the stick of rock, you won't fall too far away. It will say way mouth all the way through. Or it will say something maybe to do with the fruits of the spirit, or maybe something else that you've read that's significant to you. So we have these things as challenges. Now, one of the places where this really affects us is in the experience of intuition. Because when you make decisions and you're doing discernment, listening to the inner voice, what do you want to hear? Well, your intuition usually gives you some clues. You know, it pulls at you, it points you in a particular direction. Uh, or you think, well, that sounds good, but it's something about it not quite right. I can tell you that one of the main benefits of being married to Isabel is that she has a thing about people and quite often I've said, oh, I'm working with this guy or he's doing this or whatever and she says, yeah, I've met him and a kind of eyebrow goes up or a little thing happens and she'll, and I know that I need to look a bit more at this person or be more careful, uh, give a bit more thought because her intuition is not engaged with my relationship with it. Hers is free to be open. But maybe I'm excited about the work we're going to do together. Uh, or I'm excited about the fact we're going to travel somewhere exciting. And she's, you know, in a different place. So we ended up in this situation where we can actually become a place where we lose our intuition. And when your intuition has gone, your values are very difficult to follow. Now, another place where your values might actually become uh, uh, challenged is when you get involved in conflict. Because we're all really nice people until somebody's not nice to us. Okay? Then we become the other person. We become the somebody who has to think about this. And there are a variety of ways of thinking uh, about this, and I'm a, I'm a director of a mediation company, and this is one of our models. And so, if, if we look at these two axes, this one is whether or not you're concerned just about your own agenda. Is this about Jack winning or Justin winning, you know? Or are we concerned about the, the other person? What are we going to do here? Now, when we actually train people in this and coach them in it, of course, in many situations, collaborating sounds as if it's exactly the right thing. Let's all be friends and brothers and sisters together. The world will be wonderful and there'll be no poverty and na 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 na. Uh, except that often we have to compete. You actually have to compete because survival will depend on competition, maybe in your company or between departments fighting for a budget inside the organization. Or it may be that the best decision we can make is to compromise. Now what do you do when you compromise, when you consciously compromise? What happens to your values when you have decided the best thing we can do is compromise? You surrender some of the things that you value. So of course you need to have a boundary, certain things I can compromise on, certain things I can't. Uh, and here I'm not talking about fundamentals of uh, human morality, I'm talking about values in decision making when you're trying to do a project or inside an organisation. That's what I'm really trying to get to. What are, what are your values if what you do is you avoid conflict? There are things wrong, you know they're wrong, and what you do is you say, well I'm not going to talk about it, I'll just, just keep quiet. 
where have your values gone if you avoid? You know, where is the maturity in avoiding? But sometimes the best decision is, I'm not going to mention it. It'd be crazy for me to raise that as a problem now. Why would I even get involved in that? Because there are other problems we have to solve. So, what am I saying about values? They're not easy. You know, they're not easy. Now let's look at a completely different way of thinking about values. All right? Now let's say you're the boss of a company, you're, you're in an organization, or even you're in Funda Vida, and you decide we're going to be a fun place to be. We're going to build our culture around fun. Well, it turns out that you, I don't know how many ways you know of having fun. It turns out there are people who have spent a lot of time examining fun. And there are, according to this chap of the blog, eight different ways of having fun. I'm not going to spend time on, on them all, but you can actually build your culture in an organization around different kinds of fun. You can actually design work, you can design games, you can design team building experiences, you can do all kinds of things around the notion of fun. Now, when, when you came and you saw a, a title that said values, how deep are they, did you think we'd be talking about fun? Probably not. But that might be one of your values. You've decided that what we need to do is have more fun around this place. What we deal with is really difficult. Uh, and it's interesting to me that people who work with crisis, you know, people in hospitals, people in, you know, in the fire service or the emergency services, they nearly always have a fun value which other people think is really bad. They laugh about what happens inside the fire or they laugh about what happens in the mortuary. Because if they don't, they won't survive psychologically. Now, if you're looking from the outside, does it look like a positive value? Probably not, but you know what? It's a survival value. Many people create work as drama. This is the thing that lots of chief executives do. They make speeches which are all about, if we don't do this, we'll never survive. It's a crisis. We're in a war against the enemy. Uh, there's a new product coming out which is going to kill us. Your jobs will all go. And they create really serious negative stories around that. Other ones, generally, um, in fact, there's a lot of work now on, on leadership theory which looks at the whole notion of storytelling as the principal way of transferring values. But stories are actually the best way to transfer values in an organization. Not the thing on the wall, but the actual story. Did you hear about Samantha who met a customer last week and the customer had this problem and Samantha did something, something, something and the customer now has signed up for a two-year contract. So you make a, a, a heroine inside the organization, her name is Samantha, but the, what she did becomes the transfer of values. So these are all things in terms of actually making these things work. So I'm back to where I started. Where do I find the moral authority for my decisions? Well, for most of us, we've got something in us from our childhood uh, that has given us some values. Uh, I can tell you, I'm, I'm at the age now where the candles cost more than the price of the cake when it's my birthday, okay? Cost more to buy the candles than to buy the cake. And in the last year, I have been going through a completely new realization about weaknesses I have in terms of my values, what I stand for, and the things that I actually uh, deliver as a human being, uh, the way that I am. So I experienced something new, it was a kind of uh, a psychological intervention as it were, uh, involving a tool called the Enneagram, it doesn't really matter what it's called, but it's called the Enneagram, it's used in lots of churches, and I suddenly had to revisit my life. And what I discovered was 
And this is something that the Bible is extremely strong on, but had somehow missed me for 67 years, is that we have a true self and a false self. And the false self, largely, is the self that we created when we were kids, which allowed us to be accepted by our families, to be smiled at by everybody, and we, sort of, we were okay and we could survive with that, that set of processes. But it wasn't what our potential was. It wasn't what we could really be. And so the idea even of being born again, I don't know if that's a phrase that any of you would use in your faith, uh, although I was in that sense born again, I hadn't realized what being born again actually meant uh, in, in its fullest way. So I went through a whole process and I'm still going through this, still working on it, really difficult and challenging for me to work out how do I get rid of the worst of my false self. Uh, and, and the problem is the false self's got some good points and some bad points, you know, so it's, it's tricky. So I'm working on it, and it's a change to my moral authority. Even now, I'm looking at a revision to how I understand my relationship with God and, and the, the nature of what my life could be and the problems I should make. Now, what am I doing about it? I'm actually talking to people about it now, people who know enough about it to help me with it. So I'm discussing the ways that the thing actually manages. And it's, of course, it's become an uncomfortable process in my decision making. Uh, it's a, a tricky thing to be dealing with. But there we are. That's where I'm at. Uh, you might have an easier life journey, uh, but I'm still struggling at age. Uh, I'll be 69 on Monday. Is it Monday or Tuesday as well? Yeah? I'll be 69 on Monday. And uh, I'm still struggling with this. So I've pointed you to some rock, and, and hopefully you might be able to have a taste and have a look at it later. And I will, I will personally sweep up, because part of me discovering myself and this false self is I've discovered I'm really, no, I've confirmed that I'm really lazy. And uh, so one of the problems I have is kind of internal sloth, you know. Uh, so one of the things I'll do is I'll go and I'll actually wipe this up to prove that I'm fighting against the sloth. But the rock that people have, and this is in the Bible here, in the First Corinthians, is that these guys, they all drank the same spiritual drink which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the day.